um, with the link, so they can just use that link. Thank so you very much. Like, uh, please uh, tell them to to do register, and we are going to also be uh, uh, broadcasting live on YouTube. So those who can't register, they can um, uh, watch it on YouTube. Thank you very much. Shakila, anything else? No, we're fine. I did send the YouTube and the Facebook links earlier on to all the um, panelists, so they do have that. You can share that. I will post it in the chat as well just now. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we, it's, it's two o'clock already. Uh, normally, oh. you know the queue, we would put up the uh, screen, and then when I take that down, uh, then we can um, start. Uh, Mushle, are we ready to go live? Okay, you don't need anything from me, right? You don't need anything from me? Are you? Yeah, you just, what about, are you, uh, aren't you supposed, oh yeah, you, you have to make him the host, uh, is not, yeah, that's good. Okay. okay, I'm You're opening ready. up the waiting room now. I'm going to share the screen and then uh, I suggest we all mute ourselves and we're ready to go live as soon as I take off the screen. Okay. okay. Thank you. Good luck, ladies. Take Good care. Luck. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. It's good to see you uh, all here, even if we are doing this virtually. Uh, thanks again for uh, joining us this afternoon. Um, uh, welcome to our esteemed uh, panelists. Uh, they will be introduced a bit later, but I would like to uh, welcome um, each and every one of you. Uh, that has joined us uh, this afternoon. Uh, it gives me uh, a great pleasure to um, extend our warm welcome to everyone who is with us uh, to this important webinar on prevention and combating of human trafficking. Uh, the theme for this year, uh, for, uh, for for this year, is uh, is uh, the it, it, for the World Day uh, against uh, human trafficking. Um, is also uh, uh, linked to the, 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 the voices of uh, the people who are, uh, in, uh, who are, who are uh, personally uh, affected by these um, uh, uh, issues. Uh, we are here this afternoon just to uh, highlight the importance of sharing and learning uh, from survivors of human trafficking. Uh, the survivors are important uh, uh, factors in this uh, battle against human trafficking. We also are going to hear uh, a lot from our uh, panelists this afternoon in tackling this problem. 
uh, human trafficking, as you are aware, is a global problem and one of the uh, world's most uh, shameful uh, crimes. Every year, uh, millions of uh, uh, women, uh, children are, uh, are trafficked, are traf uh, are trafficked uh, worldwide. They also, uh, this also uh, is a problem that uh, we are facing in this country. Uh, it can happen uh, in any community, any society, and victims can be any um, uh, age and also race, uh, gender, or nationality. Traffickers uh, might be use uh, might use violence in their in in in, in their tactics. Um, uh, they use, they also use uh, manipulation or they use false uh, promises of uh, well paying jobs and then also others uh, use romantic uh, relationships to uh, lure their uh, their victims uh, into a traffic uh, trafficking situation. Um, some they would use force and also uh, coercion. Um, we know that uh, some of uh, our uh, uh, members of our society are vulnerable. Uh, they also uh, uh, are very um, uh, open to exploitation. Uh, we look. They also look at people who are Im 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 impressionable. Uh, who, are who are receptive as well as uh, for those who are under a lot of uh, pressure in terms of their social uh, uh, standing. They also, uh, they also vary uh, uh, a number of reasons uh, uh, why people are get uh, that, that are exposed in this kind of um, uh, uh, situation. So that uh, also include uh, uh, psychological and also emotional vulnerability, uh, economic hardship, um, and also a lack of social uh, safety net where people are left on their own and also they are under uh, situations where the 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 in in in, the, in their spaces there is political instability. So there's a number of factors. I think you're gonna hear more about that uh, this afternoon. Uh, so we we are here just to uh, uh, open up a platform where uh, these issues can be discussed, and also we hear uh, from the victims and also how these issues can be uh, uh, dealt with. Uh, they, obviously, there are many uh, myths and misconceptions uh, uh, on these uh, issues. Uh, so recognizing uh, key indicators of human trafficking is the first step uh, in identifying um, uh, uh, victims and how they can be helped and also uh, saved lives. Not only uh, uh, indicators uh, uh, that will be uh, uh, discussed here, I mean, there are a number of uh, 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 indicators that also uh, uh, some of us are not even aware of, but there's, there's, there is a lot that is going on out there and also we want to make sure that at least we uh, make uh, the community here aware of those uh, uh, tactics that are used to uh, lure these uh, 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 victims. So it is a crime uh, that can uh, strip you uh, strip you of your dignity and also uh, that will reveal uh, that also um, in in most of the statistics also it uh, uh, it reveals that uh, that there is a, a a crime that it affects uh, millions of people around the world. Uh, it is uh, uh, exploitative and uh, enforced in a way that. Uh, 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 victims they found themselves in a corner and have no uh, uh, way to go and also to be assisted uh, in terms of this uh, uh, crime and you've seen a lot of uh, uh, movies that actually portray this problem as huge around the globe so we are certainly uh, uh, in need of a, a a society that is uh, that will come together to bring about change and discussions like this uh, to raise awareness as i said you know to dispel the the secrecy that allows for human trafficking to drive we need to find solutions uh, raise awareness and for and also have those individuals uh, that advocate you know for for and lobby um uh, for these uh, matters, so, so we need to make sure that we have advocacy groups and lobby, and and which will then lobby uh, even our politicians and hold uh, uh, demonstrations where where required, just to make sure that people are aware of these uh, uh, problems. We certainly need to bring uh, this practice to an end. 
Uh, so on that note, I would leave the discussion to this uh, to our experts who are here uh, this afternoon. But before I I, I uh, get off this stage, let me uh, introduce our our facilitator, uh, Miss Kebile Fuse, Fu, uh, Fuse, who is the the victim uh, assistant officer at uh, at the Stenga Tutuzela Care Center. She is being employed uh, by the Sexual Offences and Community Affairs Unit of the National Prosecution uh, Prosecuting Authority. She's been uh, working with the victims of sexual offences, including victims of trafficking, um, uh, uh, trafficking in persons for the for the last ten years. She has a bachelor's. Uh, uh, she has a bachelor of psychology degree uh, obtained from the University of Zululand. And she's uh, she also have a high uh, ha has a higher certificate diploma in management, um, and also she's currently uh, doing her bachelor of arts honors in gender uh, studies uh, with UNISA. So I would like to again welcome uh, the panelists and welcome all our um, uh, uh, participants and. Uh, Wish you well uh, in all the deliberations this afternoon. I would like to then hand over to uh, Ms. Fuse to take us through uh, the program this afternoon. Thank you and uh, all the best. Thank you so much, Ms. Zondo. Thank you so much. Um, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to have to be with you and to facilitate this program um, today. I would like to do a special greetings to the UKZN management, to the UKZN representatives, and to all the students who are with us in the in this platform. Uh, let us start our webinar or our session by laying down uh, the house rules. Please record all your questions in a question and answer chat. We will then address all the questions once our presentation has been concluded and completed. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Advocate Coleman Malinga. Advocate Don Coleman Malinga, studied at University of South Africa and has LLM degree. She has been working for the NPA since 1997 and works for the Sexual Offenses and Community Affairs Unit. She currently holds the position of a senior state advocate at DPP office in Peter Maritzburg. Advocate Coleman Malinga chairs the human trafficking, harmful traditional practices, prostitution, pornography, and brothel task team. She also chairs the KZN Provincial Rapid Response Team for Trafficking in Persons. She's a member of the National Intersectoral Trafficking in Persons Task Team. She's a nodal point for KZN Trafficking in Persons and a member of the training team for National Prosecuting Authority in Trafficking in Persons. Over to you, Advocate Colmen Malinga. Thank you very much, Mrs. Fusi, for that um, warm introduction and good afternoon to everyone who's joining us this afternoon. Thank you very much for affording us the opportunity to utilize this platform to create some awareness on trafficking in persons. So the first week of October is marked as National Trafficking in Persons Awareness Week by the South African government. And um, the Trafficking in Persons Awareness Week runs from the 1st to the 8th of October. And this year's theme runs, uh, 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 reflects what we would rather say is victims' voices lead the way. And this places the victim at the center of our campaign. And what we are doing is we're highlighting the importance of listening to our victims and learning from them in how to deal with them. So we see victims as the key actors in the fight against trafficking in persons, and they are playing a critical role in establishing effective measures to prevent um, this crime and also to identify um, victims and rescue them once they have been identified. So this initiative, this webinar is part of 
um, a series of webinars we will be hosting this week um, as the HHPPB task team to create awareness on trafficking in persons um, because of it being Trafficking in Persons Awareness Week. So as an in introduction um, to my presentation, I'd just like to play this short video about victims and their voices. I was forced to be a drug mule. One thing I would like to say to journalists is please, when you share our stories, make sure it's presented the way we said it. Help us spread the right news to people. To the police, please don't take things lightly. When the case is reported, please act immediately and protect the victim always. Believe what the victim tells you before it's too late. To others out there, please always be alert. Don't believe anything you are promised by people. Always get involved in community awareness. When you see something suspicious, always speak out. Please change. We are human. We deserve to be treated as human and to be protected. I am the survivor, but the predators are still out there. So when we look at what is trafficking in persons, um, we need to understand that this is not a new phenomenon and it's definitely not something that arrived with the World Cup in 2010, although that is when most people started to talk about it. Um, it's really just a way of defining something that never really died and that is the slave trade. So it's been around um, for the history of mankind. It's been around in Africa, in the Middle East, in Asia, Europe, and the Hello. Okay, we can hear you now. You were cut off for a while. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm not sure where you then lost me from. You just, can, you, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, Where are you now? Okay, let me... I'm so sorry about that. I'm not sure why I was cut off. Okay, let me, let me just share my presentation again, and then we can proceed from there. Thank you, Don. Okay, so I hope you can see the presentation now. Um, so what I was saying is um, trafficking in persons is not necessarily people locked in chains, um, or children in cages, but it's often in plain sight. It's people in fields, it's um, people working in kitchens, and it's people often standing innocuously on the side of the road. So in many instances, um, we need to look behind, beyond the surface or beneath the surface in order to identify victims of trafficking. It may be people working in a factory, for example, that on the surface looks like it's a legitimate business. But if you start to look beneath the surface, you will discover that indeed there are victims of trafficking. So if you look at some of the characteristics of victims of trafficking and trafficking in general, you will see that victims of trafficking are viewed as commodities. So if you look at how the traffickers view the victims, um, the victims are merely the commodity that can be sold um, or resold, um, that can be exploited and can be disposed of when they are no longer useful or profitable. So instead of dealing in drugs or dealing in guns, 
um, the traffickers deal in human beings. So the human being is the actual commodity. We find that direct reports of trafficking in persons are very rare. It's normally the underlying offenses that are reported to us. So you won't often find a victim of trafficking that will go into the police station and say, please help me, I've been a victim of trafficking um, and I need assistance. We will normally um, find victims of trafficking through um, doing um, a raid on a factory for something else um, or an arrest um, for immigration offenses or um, you know, for some other kind of offense and then we will discover that the person is a victim of trafficking. The second characteristic of trafficking um, that most people don't understand is that trafficking in persons can happen both locally and internationally. So in South Africa, we have seen people that have been trafficked um, from Thailand, from Lesotho, from Mozambique, from Swaziland to South Africa. So yes, they have crossed international borders, but we've also seen people who've been trafficked locally. So we have seen people being trafficked from Cape Town. We've seen people being trafficked from Bloemfontein, but we've also seen people being trafficked much more um, closely, for example, from areas surrounding Durban into Durban. Trafficking can also be perpetrated by multiple people um, in a syndicate type of organization. So multiple people that will commit multiple acts, or it can be committed by one person performing multiple acts. So if you look at a typical syndicate, you might have a number of different role players. You could have a recruiter, you could have a spotter, you could have a harborer, you could have a financer, you could have a brothel keeper, for example, if it's for sexual exploitation. Um, and these could all be very different people based in very different places. They all perform different acts within the organized criminal syndicate, but you could also have one person who performs all of these acts. So sometimes in a syndicate, um, we may not be able to trace all of the different role players in the syndicate. Um, sometimes we may only arrest a few people in the syndicate, but when we arrest people in the syndicate, we have to be able to prove all of the elements of the offense of trafficking in persons against each of the accused if we want to secure a conviction against each one of the accused for trafficking in persons. So when we look at the elements of the offense, what we are referring to is three elements. And I'm gonna distinguish here between adults and between children. When we're looking at adults, the three elements we're going to look at is the act. In other words, what does, what does the trafficker do? What act does the trafficker perform? The means is, how does the trafficker do this um, act? How do they perform this act? And the purpose is why? What is the um, act performed for? So in, for adults, we have to prove all three elements of the offense, the act, the means, and the purpose. And then for children, we only have to prove two elements of the offense, the act and the purpose. So um, when we, we, we need to make a distinction. So it's, it's relevant because a child cannot consent um, to their own uh, exploitation. So if we have a look at what do I mean when I'm talking about acts? What am I talking about? So when we talk about the syndicate, Remember, you could have someone in the syndicate that solely deals with recruitment. They recruit victims. Um, you could have somebody that delivers the victims, you could have somebody separate that transports the victims, that transfers the victims, a completely different person that harbors the victims. You could, uh, somebody could sell the victims. We could, uh, somebody could be involved in exchanging the victims because we often see exchange, especially in uh, the context of sexual exploitation. We see victims are moved from place to place so that there is variety for clientele um, in different places. Um, you could have leasing being an act, and I'm not talking about leasing of premises, I'm talking about the leasing of a person or you could have somebody in the syndicate who merely receives a person. So 
These could be any of the acts that could be performed by a person. So recruitment doesn't necessarily have to be formal recruitment. We could refer to a situation like this. Sorry, we don't have any sound. So the recruitment could be done in an informal way of promises of a job opportunity um, that, is, that is done, um, you know, very informally um, through, through, you know, just a promise of a job. Sorry, I believe there was no sound on the video, uh, technological challenges. So these acts um, are performed um, by means of, for example, when it comes to adults, uh, threats of harm, it could be through some kind of force or coercion on the part of the trafficker. People could be recruited, for example, by abduction or kidnapping. There could be some kind of um, fraud or deception. The job offers false, um, or they could um, uh, exploit a person's position of vulnerability, or there could be and abuse of power. So when we talk about abusing a person's position of vulnerability, for example, we're talking about the fact that many people are vulnerable um, for various different reasons, like for example, their social circumstances or the economic circumstances. Um, they could be addicted to dependence producing substances, for example. They may have entered the Republic illegally um, or remained in the Republic illegally. And what happens is the traffickers abuse that position of vulnerability. So they, they, they exploit people and they abuse that position of vulnerability and the person believes that they have no reasonable alternative but to submit to that exploitation. So I'll give you an example of a case that took place here in Durban. Um, so the accused in this particular case, it was State versus Wayne. They recruited young girls by using the lover boy approach as one method. They pretended to these girls that they were the, the boyfriend of the victims and um, they offered them accommodation. Um, or they approached people who were really vulnerable, living on the street, um, and they promised them accommodation. Um, alternatively, they found existing drug addicts on the street and they offered them this accommodation. Once they had all of these victims, um, they either fed the existing drug had habits or they taught them or instructed them how to become addicted to drugs. And once they were completely addicted, so they fed them drugs, they gave them drugs, but once they were addicted, they withheld the drugs. And these were hardcore drugs. And those of you who've worked with drug addicts know that if you withhold drugs from somebody, they can get violently ill. So once they were completely dependent on the drugs, they said to them, if you want more drugs, you need to go out and you need to sell your body. So the traffickers created the vulnerability in the victims, which they then later used to exploit them. So the victims would then have sex with the clients and bring back the money. The earnings were taken by the traffickers. And um, in exchange for the earnings, they were either given um, some kind of um, uh, drug or, and in some instances, they were given like 25 rand a day. And theoretically, this money was used to pay for the accommodation. So they were sex slaves. Um, they were exploited by their traffickers. 
So we've looked at what the act means and we've looked at what the means uh, is. Now, what is the purpose of trafficking in persons? Why are people trafficked? And there's only one reason. The primary motive behind trafficking in persons is to make a profit. And how do the traffickers make a profit? By exploiting other people. And, and this is a very key element of trafficking in persons, is that it must be for any form or manner of exploitation. So the intention must be to exploit um, the person. And the actual exploitation need not have actually already occurred, but it must be that the intention is to exploit the person. And this is what often distinguishes trafficking, human trafficking, from other types of offenses like kidnapping for ransom or um, what we would term loosely parental abductions is that trafficking, there has to be the intention to exploit the person. So we often see a lot of fake media where people say a child has gone missing and it must be human trafficking. It's not necessarily human trafficking. What we need to understand is for it to be human trafficking, there has to be an intention to exploit for one of the following purposes, for sexual exploitation, um, for some kind of slavery or practices similar to slavery, um, for servitude, for forced labor, um, for child labor, to remove body parts for muti or organ transplant, for example, or to impregnate the female person against her will for the purposes of selling the child when the child is born. This is not a closed list, but this is what the act refers to. So if you have a look at the three elements of trafficking, the act, the means, and the purpose, this is what we would have to look at in terms of a prosecution. What act is performed? How, by what means is that act performed and for what purpose? So you can see trafficking covers a vast array of acts and a vast array of purposes. So in South Africa, we have a trafficking in persons helpline. Um, it's 0800 222 777. And um, so if people want more information or if you suspect trafficking in persons, you can always report it to that number. And um, we will be conducting other webinars during the course of this week. There's one tomorrow night, the 5th of October, um, that will be hosted by Nadine Blom. And there's another webinar on the 7th of October on raising digital families in light of Trafficking in Persons Awareness Week. So I apologize for the sound, um, but thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Advocate Konmen Malinga. That was very informative and enlightening. I would like to remind everyone to post the questions on our question and answer chat. We will then address the questions towards the end of our presentations. I would, without wasting any time, I would like to introduce our second speaker, Ms. T. Dicklek. Ms. Tesha Dicklek is currently the Chief Operating Officer of Stop Trafficking of People, NPC. She studied psychology and criminology. She has gained experience in both corporate and nonprofit arena. In her younger, in, in her younger age, she experienced firsthand the secular modeling and advertising industry where exploitation is rampant. Her late husband fell victim to the debilitating effects of pornography and he eventually took his life, took his own life. Her personal experience has prompted her to become part of the anti-human trafficking network. Stop trafficking of people NPC has program called Prevention versus Cure, which assists young people to vet job opportunities. Over to you, Ms. Dickleg. Thank you very much. And Mrs. Fuse, I really appreciate this opportunity. Let me just quickly uh, share my screen with everyone. Thank you so much for everyone who has joined us. It's an absolute honor to be part of this panel. 
So as I've already been introduced, my name is Tersha de Clark. I am the COO of Stop Trafficking of People. And Stop Trafficking of People is a NPC that's existed since 2008. And we exist to combat all aspects of human trafficking. And our main focuses is preventative education, advocacy and support. However, our core focus is preventative awareness. And the reason for this is that only up to 2% of human trafficking victims ever get saved or escape. And that is why we at STOP believe so strongly in prevention. One of the tools that we have at STOP, um, as has already been no, uh, mentioned, is our program by the name of uh, Prevention Versus Cure. This is an exciting program. It is a program that is free to the public. Um, because we're an NPO, we have supporters who believe in our work and they support us and carry us financially so that we then in turn can bring you, the public, this kind of service. So today, I really want to encourage everyone listening to remember the name Prevention Versus Cure, which is a free scam vetting agency. So Stop Trafficking of People has various groups or teams across South Africa. Um, including the Western Cape, Gauteng, as well as um, Limpopo. And here's some of my team members. So we're a bunch of loonies, but also a bunch of people that are exceptionally passionate about this cause. So Dawn has already touched on what is human trafficking. So I just want to emphasize that we need to remember that human trafficking takes place through deception, coercion, or force. So I'm going to touch on the deception side of human trafficking. And of course, it's the exploitation of people's vulnerabilities for the use of their bodies or for their labor. And many people, I can actually say most people, find themselves trapped in a human trafficking situation, mostly through deception or being tricked. And that is why I'm very excited to be able to focus with you today on the deception side of human trafficking or the trickery side of human trafficking. And one thing that we must also remember and I'm not sure if Dawn touched on this, that human trafficking is the fastest growing illegal enterprise in the world. Here you'll see just a few faces of human trafficking, which has already been touched on. And I'm showing this again because I wanted to really sink in when we think of human trafficking, many people that we, for instance, speak to at STOP, when you say human trafficking, actually just the word can be so deceptive because no movement or transportation is required for human trafficking to take place. So just please keep that in mind. So just quickly, the different faces of human trafficking again, um, for the sake of repetition, uh, sex trafficking, child trafficking, forced labor and bonded labor, forced marriage, uh, forced begging, organ harvesting, and even child soldiers. So in our country, unfortunately, South Africa is a source, a transit, and a destination country which is actually quite frightening. And human trafficking is often hidden 
by other crimes. And once again, for the sake of repetition, remember that it is something that is a hidden crime due to the fact that it is often overshadowed by other crimes. And also human trafficking, mostly in South Africa through the work that we've done on the ground happens mostly from rural to urban areas. And the local contributors of human trafficking in our country are, amongst others, our poorest borders, which makes obvious sense. High unemployment, um, Muti, and we also have Ukutwala, which many of you um, might be aware of, which is arranged marriages. However, it is a traditional practice that has unfortunately been distorted throughout the past years. And then we have Zama Zamas, which is the illegal minors. Um, absent parents, and of course, technology and pornography. So my main purpose of being here today is to bring you something that is practical. And I just want to share with all of you some practical red flags when it comes to possible job scams. So I'm going to emphasize once again to you the Prevention versus Cure program that Stop Runs, which is a free scam vetting agency. So what Prevention versus Cure does is we investigate possible job scams as well as any other um, fake contractual um, offers. So remember that you can make use of this service. But in the meantime, some practicals that I would like to share with you when you are job hunting, when a family member or a friend is um, job hunting. Some of the key red flags to look out for, and these are the ones that I want to emphasize because through our investigations, we have found that these um, are some of those tricks that are used out there to get victims trapped. So when a job offer sounds too good to be true, I can assure you through experience, in most cases, it most probably is. Always keep that in mind and don't be sidetracked by emotions or excitement. If a prospective employer provides only a cell phone number to be contacted, be extra careful. That is another red flag. Um, some investigation we would like to encourage you to do yourself. For instance, if you are given a physical address, first investigate that address. This might be a very logical um, point that I'm, I'm pointing out to you, but we have seen in so many cases that we've investigated that people do not go that far to actually just look into these so-called facts that are given. The next point that I would like to share is, if you are told that you will be paid big money but you don't need any experience or any qualification. I'm sure many of you have seen um, adverts such as this or have heard of offers such as this, and we have seen it over and over and over again. That is a definite red flag to be careful of. If you are asked to only send a recent picture of yourself, that is another red flag. And also be very aware of adverts that you find on um, Gumtree, on Facebook Marketplace, and in any other small ads that you might find in newspapers. Because many of them are exceptionally dangerous and a possible trap. Also be cautious of these 
so-called prospective employers who contact you first via WhatsApp. So these points that I've just pointed out to you, I am sharing with you, some of them seem so simple um, and logical, but we have come across so many who have fallen into a trap um, due to these red flags that they did not notice. So the safety tools that I want to share with you is once again, make use of prevention versus cure. It is a free job vetting agency as well as a scam vetting agency. And you can either phone the team um, via this number that I'm sharing on the screen. And also to make it easier for you, it is also a WhatsApp number. So you can contact us via WhatsApp to that number as well. And I want to encourage you to also save this number on your cell phone, please. Another way of making contact with Prevention versus Cure is via the website, which is preventionversuscure.com. And there is a very simple and short uh, form that you can complete online and then submit through to our team. And then with all that information that you give us, we will then investigate uh, the job offer that you have received. And we will come back to you with a report to tell you whether it looks safe or whether there are far too many red flags or actually something that we know of that we've picked up from some of our network partners. So we can warn you whether they, um, whether it's a situation for you to actually stay away from. Um, so make use of that, please. And then there's also safety apps such as Namola and also the Freedom app. Please look them up. You can download them for free. And what's so nice about these apps is that they have a panic button that you can use and it's free of charge. And then also um, invite us, invite Stop Trafficking of People to come and speak to your institution. Um, through the year since 2008, we have developed so many programs that are age appropriate we have programs from pre-primary right through to high school, university level, and corporate level that we um, um, present and it's interactive and it's extremely informative. And we just want to equip and empower um, individuals and families and communities out there because we need to prevent people from being trafficked. Remember, as I mentioned earlier, only up to 2% of trafficked victims ever get saved um, or escape. So to contact us, um, if you want to even ask any questions or if you want us to come and talk um, at your institution, um, you can use that contact number 081-720-7181 or very easy to remember, you can email info at stoptrafficking.org.za and make contact with us, use us. That is what we're here for. This is just a quick um, slide just to hopefully um, wet some of your appetites. So one of our most popular um, talk and program is our TechWise program. And we go into a lot of depth when it comes to some popular apps that can also be dangerous and then also just some outright dangerous apps out there. So here you will see um, Stop Trafficking of People. Um, we've recently moved on to a fresh branding, um, which we are very excited about. But most importantly, please do try and memorize our contact number, our contact details, or otherwise 
please save it on your cell phone so that you can very easily make contact with us and make use of us, especially make use of prevention versus cure. You can follow prevention versus cure um, via social media as well. So for any one of you who is going out there into this world to job hunt, if you know of any loved ones who are job hunting, please do tell them of prevention versus cure. We can walk the road with you and we can help you stay safe. Thank you so much for everyone's time. Thank you so much, Ms. Dicklick. That was incredible. We also welcome the comments from the students. If you guys don't have questions, you can also type your comments based on the presentation by our panelists. Uh, without wasting any time, I would like to introduce our last speaker, which is our third speaker, Advocate Shongwani. Advocate um, Samgil Siwe Shongwani is employed by Sexual Offenses and Community Affairs Unit of the NPA. She's a junior state advocate and joined the NPA in 2008. She works as a case manager at Peter Marisbeck Magistrate Court for the Edendale to Tuzela Case Center. She holds an LLB degree obtained in 2014 at UKZN. Um, Advocate Flongwane has been educating stakeholders on trafficking in persons and is currently awaiting judgment on her first trafficking in person prosecution. Over to you, Advocate Longani. the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Sabile, for that uh, beautiful introduction. Greetings to everyone who is part of this program this afternoon. Without wasting any time, I will go straight to my presentation. You are with us, Samge. Is my slide showing? Not as yet. Oh my God. Let us give you a moment. Please. Uh. Apologies, everyone. Can we give uh, Advocate Longani a second for her to display her presentation on the screen? Yeah. I'm struggling. Can I project it for you? Yes, please, Don. We can now see the presentation. Uh, I don't see it. Sami, can you see it on your side? I think we lost her. Okay, can I... Maybe what I can do, if you would like, is just step in and I will start with the presentation and she can take over when um, she comes back. Is that in order with everyone? Please continue. Yes, okay. Don. Please, Don, that would be good. If you can just let me know when Sam is back and then we can, we, she can take over from me again. Okay. 
Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to just have a look at some of the control mechanisms, which are the methods that are used by traffickers to control victims of trafficking. Because a lot of time, uh, people will say to us, um, once the traffickers have the victims of trafficking, why don't they run away? Um, so one has to remember that the success for traffickers only comes if they can control their victims once they have them. So traffickers often will identify the vulnerabilities of victims. For example, they look at the, um, they look for people in situations of poverty, um, people who are looking for job opportunities or opportunities to study, um, and they will specifically target those victims. And we have to remember that our victims often come from varied backgrounds, um, socioeconomic backgrounds, educational backgrounds, um, but the common feature is the vulnerabilities. So they will target vulnerable victims. They will obtain um, the vulnerable victims. They will recruit the vulnerable victims. And thereafter, they need to maintain the control over that person. So a number of methods can be used to maintain control over the victims. Um, yes, of course, we have um, the violence, the death threats, um, you know, we have, uh, you know, deception, we've seen um, imprisonment, we see collusion, we see um, debt bondage, which is um, a debt that victims believe that they owe, um, the, we see collusive methods that are used with victims, um, isolation, and sometimes we see things like um, religion or cultural beliefs being used to maintain the control over the victims. Um, like juju. Um, so if we look at um, the control mechanisms, uh, the traffickers often have to individualize how they control their victims. So it's not a one size fits all um, for the victims. Um, they, will, they might have 20 victims, but they will have to individualize the control method that they use for each victim. So in a particular factory or in a particular farm or in a particular um, brothel, they may have different um, control mechanisms and they may even use a blend of control mechanisms um, to control the victims. Um, and the, the type of control mechanism that they use um, will uh, often uh, differ according to the individual victim. Um, it will differ according to the type of victim that you have. It may differ according to the stage of the trafficking process, um, the nature of the location where the exploitation is taking place, um, and also the opportunities presented by circumstances. Um, so it's also important to remember that just because a victim has not been assaulted or has not been confined or locked up, that it does not mean that they are controlled. That's why I said in my presentation that um, oftentimes trafficking in persons takes place in plain sight. It's not the victim in a cage or a victim um, with bruised eyes, et cetera, because of the varying control mechanisms that are used. So it, an example of how a blend of control mechanisms can be used, um, you might have deception that's used at the beginning when the victim is recruited. So the trafficker might say to the victim, it's bar work, it's really well paid, um, you know, over there, and it's very easy work. Um, and then this might be uh, uh, blended in with some kind of collusion with the victim, because if you can get the victim to collude with you, um, you have a good chance of keeping control over the victim. So they'll say to the victim, don't tell anyone where you're going, um, because, you know, we might have to bribe someone um, because we're having to maybe get you a work permit um, or we might have to get you to go across the border, for example. So there's a, a collusive element. Now, remember, I said they're targeting vulnerable people. So it might be someone who's desperate for a job. So we have to collude with the person. And then they will say to the victim, and also don't worry about that permit. Um, we'll pay for it um, and you can pay us back when you get paid, you know, your first salary when you get there. So they already start to create this debt that the victim's going to owe the trafficker. And as they go through the process, um, normally this debt 
um, gets added to you uh, for clothing, for, um, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, transportation costs, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the traffickers then um, will approach the situation as they go along and they, they will continue to add to this debt. So at the destination, um, it may not be possible anymore to deceive the victim because now they realize they get there, um, there isn't any bar work um, that they were promised. They now realize that they actually have to work in a factory or in the fields or in the brothel. Um, so now the control mechanism could be a little bit more different. It might become more threatening or violent. Um, you know, they might be told, you're not grateful. We don't like people who aren't grateful. Um, you need to do your work or you're going to be, get beaten. And I, I remember seeing a quote by a brothel owner that said, um, once the victim becomes scared, then they really start to work. Um, so then, you know, or they might use the debt bondage. Um, so they'll say, we paid for your permit. Now we're giving you a place to eat and to sleep. Uh, you know, you wanted this job and you owe us this money. So they use a, a blend of these control mechanisms. And it can be quite confusing as well because traffickers often make concessions to victims. So they, they may make a concession um, to the victim in order to help maintain control over the victim um, or to try and reduce the chance of the victim trying to escape. And it's also confusing because they might give them small amounts of freedom, um, they may give them a small amount of money. So when the police, for example, do a raid, um, they find out that the victim might have been receiving some kind of salary for the work that they were doing in the factory. Um, so, you know, they, it, it can be confusing. Like the victim's not receiving no money, um, but if you really analyze it, you'll see that they are being exploited. So they might get certain privileges, like they might be allowed to make a phone call home. Um, so when there are concessions that are made, this is, there's normally some kind of powerful threat, um, be it direct or indirect, um, that is made in the background to the victim. Um, yeah, so debt bondage is actually um, quite a common method that is used to control victims. And in fact, it's an offense in terms of the Act, Section 5 of the Act. Um, it's an offense to keep somebody in debt bondage. So they have these exorbitant debts that are pay, that they owe, and they're told that they have to pay off this debt. And once they've paid off the debt, then of course they're free to go. Um, and but whilst they're working off their debt, expenses get added continuously to this debt that they have to pay. Um, so they often get fined for various things. So if they work in a brothel, for example, they may be fined if they are menstruating or they're sick or they're unable to work. Um, or um, they only get a percentage of their money because the rest goes towards protection, um, you know, by bodyguards, et cetera, et cetera. Drug addiction, like I mentioned in the Zweni case, um, often the traffickers forcefully addict the victims to drugs, and that's um, to keep them obviously compliant. It's a very strong control mechanism, um, you know, to keep the victims in line. They give them their first fix, and um, once they're dependent, um, you know, they're very easily able to control them because they're given their wake up in, their morning, in the morning and their bodies will crave the drugs for the rest of their day. Um, one of the big red flags for trafficking in persons um, is when people's um, passports and other travel documents are confiscated um, by traffickers. And they often, in inverted commas, will tell the victims it's for safekeeping purposes. Um, but in fact, what they're trying to do is limit their ability to move. So if they're in the country um, and they have got passports or other forms of identification, it's much more difficult to leave if they don't have access to this, um, you know, to their passports. So without this, they can't escape or leave. Um, so victims are often also threatened by the traffickers. Um, with corrupt police officials. Um, they told that um, they may have uh, um, uh, police officials in their pockets. They, the traffickers often point out random people and say those are police officers, they corrupt. They may not be police officers, but the victims believe that they are indeed police officers 
um, that are, um, you know, there and that are corrupt. And if they try and leave, that the authorities will lock them up. The other thing is that, um, you know, the, the places where um, the traffickers exploit the victims are often remote and very difficult to access. Um, you know, we, uh, um, Tasha mentioned the Zamazamas and the mines. I mean, these are remote places where people are unsure uh, or, it's, you know, there's no people around. So, it's, you know, people don't know where they are. Um, these, they're on farms in the middle of nowhere. Um, they're locked into factories. So, you know, people don't even know that they're actually in these places. So they're remote, they're difficult to access. And we see that often in agriculture and mining, for example. And then when you look at domestic servitude with domestic employees, they're in a single household, they have limited interaction with the outside world or no interaction. So reporting is incredibly difficult um, to, you know, to do. So they're isolated, they have little money, um, so they're trapped in situations. Oftentimes they can't communicate because they don't, they're from a different country, they don't speak the local language. Um, yeah, and they often um, are controlled um, by um, the, the, the traffickers leveraging their unfamiliar, unfamiliarity with the laws, their rights, um, et cetera. Um, they get moved frequently. This is also to destabilize them. So they're not really sure where they are and they're often prevented from making phone calls. In some instances, for sure, we have seen victims that have been locked away, um, been locked into buildings. So you will go into a building and you'll see the doors are locked from the outside, which obviously shows that they're deprived of their freedom of movement. Um, they're kept under guard, for example. And with domestic servitude, the people are not allowed to leave the house or if they do leave, they're kept under close supervision or guard. Um, so we also see physical violence. We have seen that um, where people have, um, you know, been uh, physically assaulted or raped. Um, and in the one case, we had a, 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 a lady whose child, um, three-year-old child was held captive in order to force her to work, um, you know, to sell her body. So there are various, um, you know, physical um, types of violence that are used, but also these psychological types of violence that are used to people uh, to keep victims compliant. And then, of course, I've mentioned the collusion. Um, and, you know, in terms of um, uh, uh, sometimes victims may know that they are coming to a particular um country and they know that they might be coming to a particular country to do a particular kind of work. Um, like, for example, a, we've seen cases where victims are coming from Thailand. They know that they're coming to South Africa to work as prostitutes in the sex industry. They know that it's illegal in South Africa. But despite that, when they get here, they don't get what was promised to them and they are exploited. But the fact of the matter is they feel unable to access law enforcement because of the fact that they knew they were coming to South Africa. This does not mean that they are not victims of trafficking. And then another um, uh, method to control victims is, of course, the relationship control. We know as the lover boy approach, um, they make victims believe that they're in the relationship with the trafficker. Um, they believe that they are the boyfriend or girlfriend of the trafficker. So the, the, the trafficker makes them believe that they are dependent on them. They're in love with them. They need them for accommodation. They encourage them to run away from home, to break ties with their family. And once that relationship and trust is established, they exploit them. Um, we've seen, uh, we call it now Stockholm Syndrome, although the terminology has changed, we realize that or capture, bond, uh, capture bonding, and we know that in terms of psychology, this um, terminology has changed, but we, we often see that our victims suffer, um, you know, from an in inverted commas Stockholm Syndrome, where they 
Sometimes the, the traffickers are, 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 some of them are nicer to the victims, so they feel they try and defend them. So often it's confusing for law enforcement. They'll go and raid a premises and the victims will say, don't arrest this guy. Please don't arrest this guy. He's a good guy. But in fact, de facto, he's one of the traffickers. But it's because in, in this incredibly traumatic situation that the victims find themselves in, one of the traffickers displays some sort of kindness to them and they start to identify with this trafficker, for example. So it's a defense mechanism in, in extreme traumatic situations. So why do we need to know this? Um, because um, often, like I said, victims are in plain sight. It's not a case of them constantly being held under guard. If they use cultural practices or practices like juju um, or witchcraft, you don't need anyone to control the victim at all, the victim can be put out on the street without anybody watching them because they believe the guards are watching them. Um, so we need to know what these control mechanisms are so that we can take appropriate me measures to reduce the effectiveness of the control mechanisms. We need to recognize the key red flags um, uh, to identifying victims of trafficking um, with, because they are on plain sight and understand these control mechanisms um, so that we can um, you know, be trauma-informed when we target um, victims of trafficking in terms of prevention and aftercare services. So I believe Samke is back. Are you back, Samke? Yes, Don, I am back. Do you want to take it from here? Yes, I can, but keep on projecting it, please. Sure. Thank you. Uh, sorry about that, uh, everyone. Uh, they've explained everything about uh, human trafficking and the uh, control mechanism. But what is it that pushes and pulls the victim into these circumstances? Next slide, Don. Um, push factors. Trafficking, uh, trafficking in human being is a high profit, low risk crime based upon the principle of supply and demand. So the reason why human trafficking is happening is because there is a demand. So because there is a demand, there has to be supply. Criminal networks take advantage of the series of what is known as push factor as well as pull factors which explains why vulnerable individuals would love, would le who lack opportunities and seek better living condition in their own or foreign countries end up being part of human trafficking. This in, com in combination with demand for cheap labor, body parts and sexual services fuels human trafficking. Next slide, Don. Next slide, please. Push factors. One of the most uh, common push factor is poverty. Because of poverty, people are pushed from their homes or from their countries into other countries where they find themselves in the hands of the traffickers. Lack of opportunities or alternatives such as little or no education, unemployment, or low wage employment, gender-based uh, discrimination, including domestic violence, all forms of discrimination and marginalization, life with dysfunctional families, economic imbalances between impoverished and wealthy countries or areas, impacts of political instability and corruption, conflict or transition, of countries, especially wars, decline of border controls, corrupt officials, and limited capacity of or commitment by immigration and law enforcement officers to control uh, borders. We know what is happening in our borders. It is easy to come in into our country without any proper documentation.
Traffickers deceive families uh, appro approaching parents to buy their daughters, telling lies that uh, the victim will be gainfully employed in the restaurant or in the bars. This complemented by parents being willing to sell their children due to poverty. Thus, the family is seduced into a belief and expectation that the victim will be able to support their families if they accept the proposed job. And sometimes parents will allow it just for the benefit of their own uh, child, not for their own benefit, thinking that the, 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 the child will live a better life and giving their child or their children the opportunity to live a better life. Push factors exist because people are pushed out of poor countries where economic opportunities is extremely lacking and pulled into countries that have a high level of economic prosperity uh, with corresponding demands for cheap labor. Next slide, please, Don. There are methods that are used by traffickers when they are trafficking the victims. Tempting off uh, offers of uh, lucrative jobs in the cities, coerce parents into selling their daughters, sanction prostitution by, tra by tradition and custom, uh, dupe and trick girls and parents into a false promise that they will be uh, gainfully employed at the hotel or BNB or whatever, arrange false exploitative marriages, uh, entice children to offer sexual services in exchange for lucrative jobs, gifts, or role in the movies, etc. Next slide. Uh, these factors tend to ex exert pressure on victims that push them into migration and hence into to the control of traffickers. But other factors that tend to pull potential victims can also be significant. Poverty and wealth are, relate, are relative concepts which lead to both migration and trafficking patterns in which victims move from condition of extreme poverty into the conditions of, uh, ext uh, of less extreme poverty. So everyone wants a, a, a better life. Everyone wants to um, go to where pastures are greener. So that is what pulls the victims into the hands of the traffickers. In that context, the rapid ex expansion of broadcast and television media, including the internet across the developing world, Wealth have increased that desire to migrate to, develop, to developed countries with its vulnerability of would-be migrants to traffickers. We can, we can see via um, internet uh, how other countries are perceived to be a, to be a land of, han and, of honey and milk. So that is how the, the victims would want to go to, to those countries. Pool factors. The possibilities of higher standards of living and the perception of many in poor, in poor communities that better opportunities exist in larger cities or abroad. That is what pulls them to larger cities and abroad because they've got this uh, perception that um, there the, the, the are better opportunities, opportunities there. Expectation of employment and higher financial reward, improved social position and treatment, access to material benefits associated with the West. Everyone wants to be Westernized, so that, that is one of the pull factors. Anticipation of better lifestyle, potential access to perceived glamour of the life in the cities, and portrayed, uh, portrayed as portrayed by media. Believe that um, the promised job offers the only available alternative to the continued poverty despite the well pub publicized risk. Next slide. 
In conclusion, traffickers understand and employ the push and pull factors to coerce the victims with promise of a better life and increased opportunities. So traffickers, they know that people are, are looking for a better life. They know that people are lacking employment and better opportunities. So they use those, those things to lure the victims into their hands. They employ control mechanism to keep victims in check and to get them to continue working so that they are able to exploit victims. Once they're in their hands, they have mechanism in place to control them so that they keep them with them for as long as they still need them so that they are able to uh, work for them and make profit, profit out of the victims. Traffickers in uh, trafficking in person is a complex problem as it's often happening in plain sight and is difficult to identify. So in, our, in every day in our life, we see people who are being trafficked, but we, we cannot tell that this person is being trafficked. Victim may appear to be com complicit and many will not even self-identify uh, of trafficking in person as they are grateful for the opportunity. So all in all, human trafficking is real and human trafficking is happening uh, before us. We can see it every day, but we cannot identify it. So not everyone who's standing on the streets selling herself is there because he likes to be there. He is, uh, that person might be uh, controlled, might be watched. So it is not easy for that person to walk away of the situation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Advocate Longwane. That was phenomenal. And also a big thank you to Advocate Colmin Malinga, who stepped in while Advocate Longwane was having a challenge of the network connection. Uh, we will move over with our session, whereby we will look at the questions from the students to the panel. I would like to raise the first question and direct it to Mr. Clegg. There was a question, Mr. Clegg, um, that uh, asked whether the, the red flags that you spoke about do apply to the learnership and internship programs. Mr. Clegg. Is Mr. Clegg with us? On that absence, I would like to proceed and direct the second question to Advocate Colmen Malinga. Advocate Colmen Malinga, there's a question that asks, how can we get involved to assist the cause against human trafficking? And where can we find statistics about the ongoing trends on, on trafficking in persons in, S in South Africa? Okay, so... Um, as you mentioned, I am the um, chairperson of the HHPPB task team at the beginning of the um, at the beginning of my presentation. So the HHPPB task team, we do a number of events um, throughout the year aimed at increasing awareness on trafficking in persons. So I'd like to invite you all who are listening. We are actually having an event on the 9th of October. Um, we are going to hit the streets and um, we are meeting at the old driving in Durban or the bike in Bean at nine o'clock. And we are going to hit the streets with some pamphlets and some very evocative beer coasters with emotive language on it to go and um, create awareness about trafficking in person. So we're going to be targeting bars and hotels and um, we're going to be handing them out in order to increase, increase awareness. We're meeting at nine o'clock. So the way to get involved is to join either one of the organizations involved, either in creating prevention around trafficking persons, because we look at it from a prevention perspective. We look at it from a protection perspective. So if you're a social worker, 
um, psychologists, psychiatrists, um, you know, you could always look at um, joining one of the organizations, offering your services that are doing counseling. Um, and then, um, you know, there's various different ways that we raise awareness. And there's a lot of organizations out there, NGOs, faith-based organizations that you could become affiliated with and offer your time to. Um, as far as looking at how you can find out what's going on in South Africa around trafficking in persons, um, we actually get ranked every year. Um, so you can go and have a look at what is called the US Trafficking in Persons Report. We call it the US TIP Report. So each and every year, um, the US drafts a report because we signed the Palermo Protocol. Um, you can go and have a look. Um, the US drafts a report um, on us and, and how what the state of trafficking in persons is like in South Africa. So in other words, because we've signed the Palermo Protocol, we are obliged to enact um, legislation around trafficking in persons, which we did. We are obliged to prevent trafficking, uh, to prosecute trafficking in persons cases, um, and to you know, do awareness, et cetera. So they rank us according to our efforts to combat and prevent trafficking in persons. So they, that report will tell you exactly what South Africa and the government is doing around trafficking in persons. So look for it. You can Google it. You'll find it. It's called the US TIP Report. And currently, we're not doing so well. Um, we ranked um, as Tier 2 watch list, which uh, the only three tiers, and the worst one is Tier 3. So we need to do a lot more around trafficking in persons as a country. Thank you. Thank you, Advocate Colman Malinga. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Dickleg, would you like to take you the first question that was posed to you? Yes, of course, certainly. I'm sorry, there was a bit of a hiccup earlier on my side. Um, okay, so the first question that asks, how can one get involved? Um, I think Dawn has also touched quite a bit on that. But with regards to um, stop trafficking of people, um, if you if your heart is to um, fight the fight when it comes to prevention, then STOP can actually equip you to become a volunteer and we will train you on the various programs. So whether your heart is for um, working with children, we have our STOP Junior program that is age appropriate, that has been developed for pre-primary through to um, high school. And um, we go into schools and we like hip and happening and we're full of life and we're very interactive with the kids and we teach them um, about um, safe people and not safe people. We teach them how to notice red flags and also um, how to stay safe. And then we also um, very importantly teach them the National Human Trafficking Hotline number, um, etc. So that is one way of how one can get involved. And then also just advocate. Um, we can all be advocates for this cause. You don't necessarily have to belong to an organization or be a volunteer. Sorry if you hear noise on my side. Um, so yes, so you can advocate for the cause. And also get resources. <laughs> you can get resources um, from us as well. And then also... Um, you can go onto our website, follow us on social media. What we really try and do on social media is also inform and equip people on um, what is happening currently on the ground and also about um, the actual facts of human trafficking. So I hope that helps um, some people who have asked. Thanks, Ms. Dickleck. Um, in that... Um on that note, I would like to do a follow-up question because there was a question that says the, the red flags that you were talking about, do they apply to the learnership programs as well as internship programs? Oh, yes, most definitely. So we, 
with our programs, we actually do go a lot more in detail um, when it comes to um, tips and tools to help people stay safe. So yes, definitely. Thank you so much with that uh, response. Uh, I'm looking at our time and it's not on our side. I was willing to take uh, one more question, but because of time, I would request our panelists to, to respond to our chat um, about the way and when the awareness that Advocate Malinga was talking about, as well as to answer the question in terms of uh, the booklet. There was a question that asked whether there is a booklet uh, that has information about human trafficking. Can I request the panelists to respond on our chat so that uh, the student can receive uh, the response and information about their questions? Without wasting any time, I would like to hand over to Advocate Omashni Naidu, who is the Acting Deputy Director of the NPA under Soka Unit. Uh, Advocate Omashni will give us the summary of our webinar, uh, the closing remarks, and vote of thanks. I would like to hand you to hand over to you, Advocate um, Naidu. Thank you, Ms. Wuse. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, quite an honor to be given the task of having to provide the vote of thanks. So on behalf of the Sexual Offenses and Community Affairs Unit within the National Prosecuting Authority, I would like to extend my warm vote of thanks um, to our presenters, firstly. You've done a fantastic job in creating awareness in terms of human trafficking, the need, the urgency for this awareness, and for bringing to light the seriousness in this organized crime. I'd also like to extend my appreciation, like I've said to the panel members, you've taken time to be here today um, and share your expertise um, that came out quite clear as you went through very practical examples in terms of how human trafficking affects us all. You went on to, to talk aspects where we might not think a person's been trafficked. But as we've often heard the saying, let's look beneath the surface. And that's what you've taught us to do. To Ms. Fusi, I must say thank you. Um, thank you very much for leading this program so eloquently. Um, you've guided the presenters as they went through their presentations, but you also provided a very firm foundation in what is deemed a very serious topic. So I thank you. Um, I must also thank Ms. Norma Zondi, the Executive Director of Corporate Relations, as well as Ms. Um, uh, sorry, Mr. Dlamini and Ms. Taku Pasad, but also for the rest of the UKZN team. You have worked tirelessly throughout this program to ensure that we have the number of attendees that we do, that you've got a well-groomed um, presenters who are well versed in their fields. And I thank you for hosting this webinar and reaching out to and inviting the UKZN community as well as its networks and for being so passionate about protecting the UKZN community. And I think that came out very clearly. The number of webinars that you've had on gender-based violence and femicide, including human trafficking, is indicative of your commitment to address the scourge that has plagued our society. And last but not least, having looked at the comments in the chat box, as well as the question and answers, this is quite a rife area. But you've shown that, ladies and gentlemen. You've shown your interest, you've shown your concern, and you've shown your, your thirst for knowledge. And I appreciate that. Thank you for taking the time to attend the session. And there are going to be many more of these sessions, as well as articles on gender-based violence and femicide. And I look forward to engaging with you on this area that requires a very strong um, team approach. So our colleagues, our presenters have spoken about the elements of trafficking. They've spoken about prevention versus cure. And I want to just quickly, very, very quickly highlight, please remember the TIP hotline, 0800 777. Please remember that number. Please also remember prevention versus um, the CURE program 
and your secure vetting agency on 081-720-7181. Now, those are important numbers to remember. Also remember, ladies and gentlemen, that our socioeconomic factors play a very vital role. And this is not a fight we can fight alone. And therefore, it is important as stakeholders that we hold hands together and we address these problems, these push-pull factors that Advocate Shlongwane had spoken to. So we eradicate human trafficking. And yes, it is a big word to use. It's a mammoth task to embark upon, but it can happen if we do this together. So in closing, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to read this out to you. Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. Martin Luther King Jr. So I leave it to you, ladies and gentlemen, and I thank you colleagues for your wonderful presentations and UKZN for your commitment and partnership. And I wish you all the very best. Um, so that brings us then to the end of this webinar. And until we meet again on the next webinar, which will be, um, um, you will be told about very soon. So thank you once again. Thank you, Ms. Vuset. Thank you so much, Advocate Naidu. Thank you. And thank you so much to, the, to our panelists. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you so much for having us. Uh, please can I have presentations from all panel members who had